Hey, happy Sunday. My name is Taylor Wilkerson. My wife, Kristen, and I, we're the lead pastors here at Trinity Harlem, and we are so thankful to be joined with you on this Sunday, this Thanksgiving week. I'm thankful for you on Thanksgiving week. And can you believe it's already Thanksgiving? That's crazy to me. But hey, no matter where you are in the world, whether it's your first time joining us or your first time in a long time, I want you to know that you belong. It's something that we say here at Trinity Harlem, and it's not just a phrase. It's actually it's actually a deep belief of ours that, that, that you belong. You belong before you believe what we believe. You belong before you behave how we behave. You belong no matter where you're from, no matter what you're like. You belong because we love you and because God loves you. Man, I'm so thankful that you're joining with us on this Thanksgiving week. It is Thanksgiving week, exciting thing. Uh, this week we got to feed so many families in need across New York City. Did you know that during the pandemic that 39% of New York food emergency programs were shut down because of the pandemic? Can you just wrap your mind around that? That during the pandemic, when the most people have needed support, have needed food, have needed help to just make ends meet, during the pandemic, 39% of nonprofits of these food emergency programs had to shut down on the city. So that's why as a church this week, we stepped up and we gave away thousands of bags of groceries. We sponsored hundreds of turkeys and, and Thanksgiving meals. And it's not too late to participate. If uh, we mailed these grocery bags to everybody, uh, if you didn't get one, it's just because we don't have your address, feel free to shoot us a text message or drop it in the chat that you need one. We'll send one out to you if, if, if there's still time, Not can't guarantee that. But if you have one of these bags, hey, Go fill it up. Fill it up with some groceries, some non-perishables, and let's take it to our local food pantries. And if you need help finding a place to take it, we will help you with that. You can also sponsor a bag. Uh, you, you gotta fill that bag, give that bag, but then you can also sponsor a bag and go online, Trinity Harlem, you can figure it out. But sponsor a bag for $35, it's an entire meal, it's turkey, and it goes to helping families in need. So I love that, so amazing. But it's Thanksgiving week, and we're gonna just jump right into it because we have a lot to be thankful for. Uh, let's, let's open up our Bibles to Philippians chapter four. We got Philippians chapter four. Uh, I love Philippians, it's one of my favorite scriptures in the entire Bible. I'm just editing my notes here real fast. Um, and this is one of my favorite scriptures in the entire Bible. It says this, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Paul likes his preaching so much, he just said it again. He goes on, he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. That's a really hard part actually, that let your gentleness be ev evident to all. He's really saying like, let your faith, let like your lifestyle, let like the way that you carry yourself be obvious that you're a Jesus follower. It's kind of tough, but he says, uh, the Lord is near. He says, don't be anxious about anything. Are you anxious today? Are you worried today? Are you fearful about anything today? Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. Instead, in everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. He's saying, don't be anxious, go to God. And if you do that, the peace of God, which transcends, which is above any type of understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And this week is Thanksgiving week. I love Thanksgiving. Hopefully you're with some friends or you're with some family. Hopefully you get to eat a big meal. Uh, I, I love Thanksgiving, but the truth is Thanksgiving, although it's a beautiful holiday, Thanksgiving should not be something we do once a year. Now, the meal should probably be once a year. What, what do you eat for your Thanksgiving meal? My family, we do turkey. Do you do turkey? Drop it in the chat real quick in the comments. Do you eat turkey? Do you eat ribs? Do you, do you fry your turkey? Do you smoke your turkey? Um, I have some Haitian friends, they do oxtail on Thanksgiving. But what do you do on Thanksgiving? Well, what's your main meat? If you're a vegan, I don't, is it like a head of lettuce? Like I, I don't, like let me know, let us know. I, I think that's interesting. But Thanksgiving, like I was saying, it really shouldn't be a once a year type of thing. And I don't think any of us actually think that being thankful is a once a year kind of a thing. But man, I just love the idea that every day is Thanksgiving. In fact, I wanna to talk to you real quickly about every day being Thanksgiving. As Christians, we should live our life every single day being thankful, being filled with gratitude, being grateful, for all that God has done in 
and through our lives. And today I wanna to teach out of Philippians chapter four, how every day is Thanksgiving. Every day is Thanksgiving. So if you're taking notes, you can write down the title of the sermon, Every Day is Thanksgiving. If you're not taking notes, feel free to write down the title every day. Take your phones out, get your Bibles out. I wanna teach some scripture to you today and encourage you. But hey, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we start. Jesus, God, we thank you. We thank you that you're for us, that you're with us. We thank you that you're good. God, I pray over each and every person who's watching this, listening to this. God, I pray that they would be encouraged. God, I pray that they would be reminded of how good you are. God, I pray that we'd recognize your power and your love in our life. God, and I pray that we would rely solely on you. God, we love you today. We need you. Encourage us. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen and amen and amen. Well, hey, um, I have a question for you. Have you ever been in the situation where you were told what to do? Like someone tells you like, hey man, I need you to go do this. Have you ever been in a situation where you've been told what to do, but you don't know how to do it? Maybe you got a new job, maybe your boss is giving you tasks that you're like, oh gosh, how do I do this? Oh man, uh, but has this ever happened to you? Have you been in a situation? Hey, being told what to do, but you're like, I don't know actually how to do that. Uh, my wife and I, Kristen, we have three kids. We have Nora Hudson. We have a, a third baby girl on the way. She's going to be born potentially in the next few days here. I mean, we're right here in the last few weeks. But man, so we have three amazing, healthy children. Uh, two have been born. One is still in the womb. But man, we're so thankful for our kids. But when I think about this question, you know, have I ever been told what to do but didn't know how to do it? It makes me think of the day my daughter Nora was born. My daughter was born and it was amazing. Anyone who's a parent who's been a part of a, of a birth knows how beautiful and how impactful and how powerful the birthing moment is. Man, Kristen, she was a champion. She decided I'm going all natural. I want to feel the pain. And I was there and I was like, let's do it. And I got to be honest though. The birth wasn't the hard part. Now, I don't want to speak on Kristen's behalf. It wasn't hard for me. I was just in there doing, you know, probably just waiting for it to be over. And I was helping, but like the birth wasn't the hard part for me. It was the hard part for Kristen. It wasn't the hard part for me, obviously. I'll never forget though, after Nora was born, how beautiful she was. And I remember looking at Kristen being like, wow, you're so strong and so beautiful. And you're so, how'd you do this? I love you forever, never leave me. I remember just all the gratitude I felt that day. And then I remember just like about a few minutes after Nora was born, the doctors were like, okay, we're gonna leave you guys alone with the baby. We're like, oh, okay. and. I gotta be honest, the, the doctors and the nurses, they, they left me and Kristen and Nora alone in our room for the first time, just the three of us, just our little family. And man, I was so grateful and I was so overwhelmed and I was so, man, this is so awesome. And then she started to cry. <laughs> and when she started to cry, you know, Kristen was kind of in some pain, so she's not really getting up moving a lot yet. So I was like, oh, no, I'll take care of her. And I go and I, and I try to pick her up and, Friends, this is when I realized something. I go to pick her up and my daughter's crying. This is when I realized that I had now accepted a brand new job that I was not qualified to do. Friends, I am the youngest of four boys. I grew up around zero children. Before I had a baby, I changed zero diapers. I fed zero babies. I gave zero the babies, a bath. I knew nothing about children. And the nurses, they left the room. And, and Kristen, she was kind of incapacitated. And there I was holding this infant in my arms, realizing that I had just been given a job. I was told what to do, but I had no idea how to do it. The next morning we wake up and the nurses are like, okay, you're going to leave in just a few hours. And I was like, please, can you come with us? I was so scared. I was like, I don't know how to feed this thing. I don't know how to bathe this thing. I don't know how to clothe it. Like, what do I do with this baby girl? And I just remember feeling so 
disqualified and unable to walk in the new responsibility that I had just accepted. I was given a job. I was told what to do. You're a dad now, raise this kid, keep it alive and, and, and keep it healthy. But I honestly had no idea how to do it. And I know it's super silly today, but that's kind of like what Paul is doing in this scripture. He, he's telling Christians like what they're gonna do, but like if I'm a Christian who has just now accepted the responsibility of being a disciple of Jesus, and, and I am walking in this new calling. I'm kind of like, cool, like, but how do I do these things, Paul? Because like, check this out. He tells us what to do. He does this multiple times. He says, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. This is what we're supposed to do. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. Meaning like, always have a good attitude. Make sure everyone who sees you knows that you represent Jesus. You represent the church well, you represent Jesus well. Everyone needs to know that you're the real deal. Uh, he says, don't be anxious about anything. Instead, present your requests all to God. So he's saying, this is what you gotta do. Rejoice all the time. You gotta make sure that, that you're a good witness and that your gentleness is evident to all. And then he's like, he's like, don't ever get anxious. And again, I'm kind of like, when I read the scripture, I'm kind of like, cool, bro. Like. This is what you want me to do, but like, how do I rejoice always? How do I make sure that my gentleness is evident to all? That means like I don't snap on somebody online if they if they cut in front of me. It means that I don't get mad on Instagram and post uh, angry things. I mean, that's what he's saying. Let your gentle, like, how, how, okay, cool. You've told me what to do. Like, how do I do that? The cool thing is, Paul, it, I, I put it all on one screen so you can see that it's really just one thought. He says, if you do those things, if, if you do the how, what will happen to you is that you'll receive God's peace. And that's super cool, but again, it just kind of comes back to the simple question, like, I've been told how, I want to know, I, 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 I've been told what, but I want to be told how, right? right? Like, like, how do we actually rejoice always? How do I actually live out a faith that's evident to all? How do I not worry, but trust fully? And I think the answer to this is found right here in the scripture. And I think the key to it is that we live like every day is Thanksgiving. I think the only way, it's like, how do I actually do that? How do I actually receive a peace that transcends understanding? Come on, if you're a believer, if you're a Jesus follower, have you ever freaked out? Have you ever been afraid? Have you ever been worried about tomorrow or the next day? Have you ever known that things are beyond your control? And instead of surrendering to God and receiving that peace, if you're being honest with yourselves, maybe you've, you've kind of freaked out and you've been afraid and kept up at night and having panic attacks and struggling with depression. And has this ever been you? Because, because, because it's been me before. And the truth is Paul is telling us what to do? Hey, rejoice. Don't be anxious. Let your faith be obvious to everybody. But I'm kind of like a new, a new dad who's like, great, like you're telling me what to do, but I've never done this before. And I don't feel like I've mastered this yet. How do I do it? Well, I think the key is that we have to live with true gratitude and thankfulness always. We need to live every single day with a fresh awareness of how good God has been to us. We need to live like every day is Thanksgiving. How do we do that? Well, we do these three things. I think they're pretty practical and I hope it helps you out. This week, I wanna encourage you to do these three things. Number one, try to remember that God is near. In the midst of the chaos of, uh, of this world and, and all the stress and burden you have to carry, every day, decide I'm gonna live with thankfulness. I'm gonna live with gratitude. And how am I gonna do that? I'm gonna do that by remembering that God is near. Look what Paul does in Philippians chapter four. He, 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 gives these, uh, he gives these famous lines that you've heard before. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, rejoice. Let your judgment be evident to all. But then he just drops this sentence. The Lord is near. And I think this is really, really key because if you look at the entirety of the scripture that we're studying today, 
you'll see that, 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 that Paul, he gives these three imperative statements saying like, hey, like you need to do these things. This is what you do. And then, and then at the end, he gives like the result. Like if you do those things, you'll have peace. But he doesn't actually tell you why you do them or how you do them. He gives one phrase and it stands out and it's different than the others. And, it's a, and, 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 it, and he literally says, the Lord is near. Now, theologians debate about what Paul meant when he dropped this in there, because it kind of feels like it's out of place. I mean, he literally says, rejoice in the Lord always, let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near, don't be anxious. You're kind of like, wait, what do you mean by that? The Lord is near. Like, like, like the Lord is near, like, like, like what does that mean? Does he mean like the Lord is near, like don't forget the Lord is near? I mean, he could, he could mean that, like don't forget, because in Proverbs 15, three, uh, it says the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. Oh, I need to re remember that the Lord is near. So he's watching me. Or in, like in Hebrews, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Okay, so God sees everything. God sees my pain. God sees when I do the right thing. God sees when I do the wrong thing. Is, is that kind of what Paul's saying? Is, he, is it kind of like a warning? Is he like, hey, let your gentleness be evident to all because God sees you. He knows if you don't do it. Is that, is it like big brother? Like, is that what he means? Cause like in second Chronicles, it says for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. The Lord is looking to strengthen people. And, 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 and I'm just asking the question that when, when Paul says the Lord is near, like, does he mean like, don't forget the Lord is near? Cause if he does mean that, then that means that Paul is just trying to remind us that God sees everything. And that's actually a good statement. Like that alone could preach and that could be my whole point. But is that all that he means when he says the Lord is near? I think this is beautiful, this is encouraging. To know today that whatever it is you're going through, God sees it. He sees your fears, he sees your worries, he sees the times that you're crying yourself to sleep at night, he sees your secret sin, he sees your struggle. He sees the good, he sees the bad. He sees when you do, do it right. He sees how you perpetually keep doing it wrong. That's both encouraging and it's a warning. A warning to live righteously, to live rightly before our God. Maybe Paul is just telling us to remember that God is near because it's easy to forget that he sees us. But maybe that's not what he means. A lot of theologians think that it's not like, that like don't forget the Lord is near, but more like the coming of the Lord is near. Is that what he means? Like the coming of the Lord? Like Jesus is gonna come back, and the rapture is gonna happen, and heaven's gonna be established. Is that what he means by the Lord is near? Like that would make sense because Zephaniah uh, in the Old Testament, he talks that way. He says, be silent before the sovereign Lord for the day of the Lord is near. Okay, the Lord is near, the day of the Lord is near. That kind of feels like it could be right. And James chapter five, James says, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. So like there's this language that's kind of a, uh, about end times. And it means that when the Lord is near, maybe that means like the Lord's coming is near. And Romans, Paul, he says, the night is nearly over. The day is nearly here. So when Paul says the Lord is near, does he mean the coming of the Lord is near? Is that what he means? Well, I don't know, I, I actually kind of think it, I, I think he does mean that. I think he means that and I think he means the one before. A lot of theologians kind of debate like which one does he fully mean, but most theologians agree that it doesn't have just one meaning because if, if it means the coming of the Lord is near, it means that you and I need to remember that God will renew everything. I love this idea because Paul says the Lord is near. And maybe he's saying, friends, Whatever you're going through today, remember that the Lord's second coming is near. That heaven is gonna come and make right all that the earth got wrong. That the Lord is gonna come and renew everything. Whatever the type of pain and suffering you're currently in, you can keep going and endure till the end because I will come back. It's a promise from God. The thought that the Lord is near, that the Lord's that the coming of the Lord is near is a reminder that heaven is real, 
that our friends who are sick are going to be with Jesus if they are following him. It's a reminder that, that heaven is a place where, where there's no more pain, there's no more tears, there's no more suffering, and that heaven is near. Man, that in, in and of itself is good news. The Lord is near. Is that what Paul means, that the coming of the Lord is near, that Jesus is going to come and make right all that's wrong? Maybe it's not what he means. Maybe what he means is that the Lord is always near. The Lord is near. Maybe it means the Lord is always near. That works too. I mean, in the Bible, we know that that's a biblical truth. Psalm 145, the Lord is near to all who call on him. Acts 23, 11, the following night, the Lord stood near Paul. Paul was about to go on trial. He's about to potentially be killed for his faith. And it says that Jesus appeared near to Paul and spoke to Paul because he was close to Paul. And he said, take courage. James, again, chapter four, come near to God and he will come near to you. Is that what Paul meant by the Lord is near? Does he mean like the Lord is always near? Because if that's what he means, it means that God is close enough, that God is close to us through everything. Man, that's a beautiful truth today. That no matter what it is you're going through, that God, he sees you, that God is one day gonna make it all right. But number three, that he's simply there with you. The Bible says that Jesus wept, meaning that he cried with those who cried. He celebrated with those who celebrated. This Thanksgiving, if we're gonna live like every day is Thanksgiving, if we're gonna live our whole life every single day, not just on Thanksgiving, grateful and thankful, how do we actually live this way? How do we actually rejoice always? How do we actually walk in love and life? Well, first, we need to remember that God is always near. God is near. I think that Paul, when he says the Lord is near, I think he's giving us a reminder that God sees everything. He sees what you do that's right. He sees what you do that's wrong. And we need to remember that he's near. We need a reminder that he sees everything. I think we also need a hope, a hope that God will renew everything. Today, whatever it is you're going through, we have a hope and our hope is in heaven. The Lord is near, God is near. And it's also a comfort that God is close through everything. We need to remember that today. Like Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. Let your, let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. So do not be anxious. See, the idea that God is near sets us up for all of it. I'm able to rejoice because I know that, that, that God wins the final story. Even if my prayers don't get answered on this side of heaven the way that I wish they would, I know that God is in control and that heaven will come to earth. I know that I will be in heaven. The greatest thing for a believer is that the worst thing that can happen to you and me is that we go to heaven. God will renew everything. When, when Paul says rejoice, you can rejoice always because you can know that God sees you in your pain, that God is with you in your pain, and that God is healing this world, you can rejoice. And it's so hard though to rejoice. It's so hard to let your gentleness be evident. It's so hard to not be anxious unless you fully believe that the Lord is near, that God is close, that God, he sees you, that he's renewing this world and that he's with us in the midst of everything. It's good news. We need to remember it today. We need to remember this week, every day, wake up and spend time with God and say, God, you're with me. You're close to me. You're as close as my breath. You, God, you're with me. God, I'm thankful that your second coming, that the rapture, it's close. God, I'm thankful that you see me. It's good news today. We need to remember that the Lord is near. If we're going to live like every day's Thanksgiving, we've got to be thankful. So we're going to remember. Number two, we need to recognize if you want to live thankful, you want to live with gratitude, you need to recognize the goodness of God. Because in life, it's so easy to see all the pain. It's so easy to feel all the negative emotion. It's so easy to be angry. But man, you and I, we need to recognize the goodness of God. I love 
I love uh, Gordon Fee. He's a great theologian. And he wrote, he wrote this definition of what thanksgiving is. And he's not just talking about the holiday. He's talking about the Christian practice of thanksgiving, living with thanksgiving. He says this, thanksgiving is an explicit acknowledgement of creatureliness and dependence. It's a recognition that everything comes as a gift and it's the verbalization before God of his goodness and generosity. It's a big quote. What is Thanksgiving? The acknowledgement of creatureliness and dependence. He's a great theologian. It's the acknowledgement of creatureliness, meaning that I am finite, meaning that I am not all knowing, that I am not God. I was created by my creator. I am a creature created by the creator. I acknowledge that. I recognize that. I, it's an acknowledgement of my dependence. God, I can't do this without you. It's an acknowledgement. It's a recognition, a recognition that everything I have is a gift. It's a recognition that I didn't earn it all. Your bank account, your house, your kids, your health, your life, you didn't earn it. You might've worked hard with it. God might've dealt you a good hand or maybe you were born with a bad hand, but what you have, all of it, is a gift. And it's the recognition that everything comes as a gift. Everything comes as a gift. And then it's the verbalization. So Thanksgiving is, it's important. It's acknowledgement, recognition, and verbalization. Telling God of his goodness and generosity. Today, if we're gonna live with thankfulness, if we're gonna actually walk out this walk of Jesus with gratitude and thankfulness in our heart, we gotta recognize the goodness of God. We've gotta live out this Thanksgiving thing. It's gotta be a part of who we are. Thanksgiving does not mean simply saying, thank you, God. It's th that's not Thanksgiving, that's not enough. It's not just saying thank you in advance for the gifts that I'm gonna receive. Rather, Thanksgiving is the absolute basic posture of every believer. I think this is so beautiful. Gordon Fee, he's telling us that, that Thanksgiving is not something you say or necessarily even that you do. Thanksgiving is our posture. It's the way we approach God. It's the humble demeanor in which we live this life, understanding that we recognize that we need our Lord every single day. Man, if, the, if Thanksgiving is a posture, I love, he says, it's the proper context for petitioning God. Gratitude acknowledges and begets generosity. But man, Thanksgiving is the absolutely basic posture of the believer. You know what that means? It means that Thanksgiving isn't the celebration of a day. Thanksgiving is the condition of your heart. It's a posture. Thanksgiving isn't the celebration of a day. It's the condition of our hearts today. Thanksgiving means that we live our life humbly, acknowledging that all that we have is from God. What do you have today? Maybe today you can think of all the things you need, all the things you don't have, all the things you've lost, all the things that have been taken away from you. But instead, set that aside and realize that all that you do have is a blessing and a miracle from God. Gratitude says, God, I am thankful for the kids I do have. I'm thankful for the friends I do have. I'm thankful for the money I do have. I'm thankful for the house that I do have. I'm thankful for the car that I do have. I'm thankful for what I do have. It's easy to acknowledge all the things I don't have, but God, I recognize my dependence on you and I'm going to approach you, not from a place of frustration or anger, but with a posture of gratitude and thanksgiving. Because Thanksgiving is not just a day that we celebrate. It's not a celebration. It's a posture. It's a posture of our heart. That's what Thanksgiving is. It's isn't a celebration of a day. Thanksgiving is the condition of our heart. In fact, I'll go as far as saying that if today you're struggling with gratitude, maybe if you're being honest, you're not grateful right now. Maybe you're not really liking your life. You're not liking your job. You're not liking your wife. You're not liking your kids. 
not liking your friends, your house, whatever it is, but maybe you find yourself complaining a lot. I've been there. I think we all have. I want to encourage you and challenge you because I know that that's not the person you want to be. You don't want to be the person who's complaining. You don't want to be the person who's not grateful because gratitude is the condition of our heart. It's actually the basic posture, Gordon Fee says, as a believer. And in fact, I believe Paul, he says in, in Romans chapter one, he gives a warning. He says that although these people knew God, he's talking about pagans, he's talking about even people who were God followers. He says they knew God, they, although they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, nor did they give thanks to him. And he's setting up this reality that it's possible today, friends, that we would know who God is, but that we wouldn't actually allow him to be our God. It's possible that we would know who God is, but we wouldn't actually live our life giving thanks to him. It says that they knew God, but they didn't glorify God, nor did they give thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And although they claim to be wise, man, this is our biggest problem. We tend to lose gratitude when we think we know better than God, when we think we know what we need better than God does, when we think we know what our purpose is more than God does. Friends, let me tell you something about God. God wants you to get to where he's called you to go more than you do. God wants you to fulfill your purpose more than you want to fulfill your purpose. God wants to give you all the things that you need to do all that he's called you to do more than you think you want them. So we got to be careful not to think we know better than God. Because these people in Romans chapter 1, it says they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. They decided to worship things that look like, but they made images to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. What the Bible's saying is that these people, they lost their thanksgiving, they lost their gratitude, and they, be, they began to worship and follow other things that were not really God. Friends, it's called idolatry. Have you heard the word idolatry? It's in the Ten Commandments, have no idols. It, it, it's the first commandment, have no other gods before me. Number two, don't worship any idols. And the first step towards idolatry is not living with thanks. These people, they step into idolatry and they begin to worship other things. You might think, well, Taylor, I'm, the, the scripture you just read said that they made images and they made statues and they had things, idols that they bowed down to. Friends, that's not just what idols are. Idols are anything that we place above God in our life. Anything that we live our life for, even good things, they become bad things when they become the main thing. And we can have idols in our life, the idol of our career, the idol of a relationship we know isn't godly, the idol of an identity that we know isn't God's best plan for our life, the idol of money, the idol of, of pride. There are so many idols that we must not bow down to and we begin to take a step towards them. In fact, the way I can say it is that the moment you step away from gratitude to God is the moment you step toward idolatry. The moment you step away from being grateful to God for what you do have is the moment you step towards idolatry. God, but I wish I just had a bigger house. God, I wish I just had a little more money. Every single time, it's okay to ask God for more. It's okay, it's okay to bring our requests to God. That's what Paul's telling us to do, but it's a completely different thing when we step out of gratitude for what we do have. Because the moment we step out of gratitude, we actually step into something else. And friends, we gotta recognize that today. We've gotta recognize how good God is in our life. It's easy to recognize what you don't have, but can you recognize how good God has been? Because if you can, it's really easy to live with thanksgiving. That's when Paul, when he says rejoice in the Lord always, that's when it's possible. When I'm able to have this overwhelming gratitude and thanksgiving, I can have this gratitude and thanksgiving because the Lord has been so good to me. I can do it even when I don't feel like it. Did you know that rejoicing and that joy is a choice, not a feeling? It's a choice to rejoice. It's a literal choice. 
to say, you know what, no matter what comes my way, God, I know you're in control. I will choose to rejoice. That's why the psalmist says that this is the day the Lord has made. Made. I will rejoice and be glad in it because no matter what comes my way this day, I will rejoice because I, God, I know you brought me here because I'm living like every day's Thanksgiving. I'm living grateful. I'm living full of thanks. I'm living full of gratitude. How do we, how do we live this thing out? How do we actually do what the Bible tells us to? How do we actually live as followers of Jesus? Well, we have to live with thanksgiving in our hearts. How do we live with thanksgiving in our hearts? Well, every day we need to remember that God is near. We need to remember that God is near, that he's close, that he sees, that he loves you right where you are. He knows you. Remind yourself right now that God God's spirit is in the room with you. Remind yourself every single day by spending time in prayer that God is near and that he sees you. Remind yourself that this life is temporary and that heaven is eternal and that we need to live our life for what is eternal. Remind yourself of the story you belong to. It's longer than the 80 years you're gonna live on this earth. Remind yourself that God is near. Remind yourself. Number two, recognize the goodness of God. It's easy to think of all the things we don't have, but recognize how good God has truly been. Whenever I get down on myself, sometimes I just, what I need to do is just remind myself just how much God has done in my life. I can feel like I'm not hitting all the goals that, that I've set. I can feel like I'm not uh, doing as much as I wish I was doing. But man, the moment I start feeling that way, what I do is I just go back to my story. Well, I could have never thought that five years ago I would be the father of three children. Man, I could have never thought that five years ago would be leading the greatest church and the greatest city in the world. Man, five years ago I could have never thought, I could have never thought that I'd have such a beautiful, amazing, I could have never thought. But I can recognize the goodness of God. We need to remember, if we live with Thanksgiving, remember that God is near recognize the goodness of God. Number three, rely on your relationship with God. This is huge. Friend, today, there's so many things that we can rely on. We can rely on money. We can rely on the stock market. We can rely on politics and politicians. We can rely on friends and family. But what we need to rely on is our relationship with God. Jesus is the only one who will never leave us nor forsake us. God is the only source, the only well that never runs dry. God sees everything, knows everything, and God is infinitely good. And we become anxious and worried when we find ourselves relying on anything except him. That's why Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, remind yourself who you rely on. on every, in every situation, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving isn't something you do, it's a demeanor, it's a posture. Go to God with gratitude when you pray. Go to God with humility when you pray. Go to God with thanksgiving in your heart, reminding yourself who he is recognizing how good he has been. He's saying, do not be anxious. Instead, present your request to God. We need to rely on a relationship with God. Do not be anxious. If we do that, that anxiety, it says that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. See, the truth is what Paul's trying to teach us is that the answer to anxiety in our life is, is found in the awareness of his presence in our life. The answer to anxiety is found in the awareness of his presence. That's why Paul teaches so many times to rejoice, to pray, to give thanks, because he's trying to remind you that God is the only one you need to rely on. It's, it's fascinating because in 1 Thessalonians, it's almost the same scripture. Rejoice always, pray continually, 
and give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for your life, to live like every day is Thanksgiving. To live like every day so grateful for all that God has done. We need to remember, friends, that God is near. He sees you. We need to recognize that he's been so good in our lives. And we need to rely on our relationship with him over everything. Every day, spend time getting closer to God. It's in our closeness to God that we get distanced from, from all of our fears, our worries, and our anxieties. Friends, it's Thanksgiving week, and I'm so thankful for you today. And I just wanna pray this over you, that you would live with gratitude, that you would live with thanksgiving overflowing from your life. Can I pray that over you today? Now, let me pray these, these things over you. God, I pray over each and every person who's watching right now, God, that they would remember that you are near. God, would you remind them every single day of how close you are? If you wanna begin to, to hear God in a more clear way, would you just right now say, God, would you make me aware of how close you are to me? Would you help me, would you remind me every single day that you see me and that you care about me? I pray over you that you would recognize the goodness of God. Today, take some time and write out, write out 10 things that, that you're so grateful for that God has done in your life. God, I pray that you would help us recognize and see all the good things you have given us. God, we're so thankful for how good you have been. God, would you help us rely on you? God, I pray over each and every person that we wouldn't rely on other things, God, to bring us happiness, God, to bring us purpose, God, to bring us fulfillment. God, we rely on you. Help us trust in you, Lord. We need you. In Jesus' name. Hey, and if you're watching right now, the good news about our God is that he loves you today. And maybe right now you're, you would be honest, and I'm talking about how we need to rely on a relationship with God. And maybe today you would say, Pastor, today I don't really have a relationship with God. Today, maybe you would say that you've been in charge of your life and that God has not been in charge of your life. If that's you, well, I've got good news. The good news is that it's never too late to start again. Maybe you find yourself living for yourself and life isn't going the way you wished it would. Maybe you find yourself living for yourself and you know that God is calling you into relationship with him. Friends, if that's you today, you can give your heart, you can give your entire life over to Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. To do that, you really just do the same things that I'm preaching today. But to do that, you simply remember the fact that Jesus, he left heaven and he came to earth to die on the cross for your sins. You remember the truth that Jesus was a, was a real man who was really God and he came and, and he gave up his entire life just so that you could get to know him. Remember what he did for you. Then today, recognize the fact that you need him. Recognize that you can't live without Jesus. Recognize that you're a sinner. And although you might be a good person, no matter how good you are, you're far from perfect like I am. And we need the grace of God. Recognize we need his grace. We need a savior. And say, God, I recognize that I need you today. And then number three, you're making a commitment to rely on him. You're simply saying, God, I remember what you did. I remember who you say you are. And I recognize that I need you and that you are who you say you are. So I am going to give you my whole life. I'm gonna rely on you. You're in charge now. If that's you and you wanna pray this prayer and you wanna say, Jesus, today I'm giving you all of me. Maybe you've made the decision to follow Jesus before, but somewhere along the way you got tripped up. Maybe you find, find yourself a, a few steps back further in life than you wished you were because you were living for yourself and you weren't living for God. No matter what, I want you to know that if you repent, that word repent simply means to turn. If you turn from the way you're going and say, God, I'm gonna turn towards what you have for me. You might not know how you're gonna do all of it, but all you need to know to get started is that you're gonna do it. That you're gonna say, Jesus, I'm gonna give you my whole life. I remember who you are. Would you just pray that prayer? Right now, just pray something just like this. If that's you, you wanna give your life to Jesus. Like my grandfather always said, Taylor, it's never too late to start again. Just pray this, say, dear Jesus. Say it out loud, dear Jesus, I'm yours because I need you. I remember what you did on the cross. 
I remember how you died for my sins. God, I recognize that I need forgiveness. So God, I repent. God, I turn. God, I don't want to be in charge anymore. I want you to be in charge of my life. God, I want to rely on you fully. God, I give you my whole life, my past, my present, and my future. I'm yours. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen, amen. Well, hey, if you just prayed that prayer, man, we are so thankful that you did. The Bible says there's a party in heaven. We're having a party here at Trinity. Man, I'm so thankful that you prayed that prayer, but would you do something? It's your next step. It's to text us. Text Text the word Jesus to 646-713-2393. Text us to let us know about the decision that you just made. That's your next step in your walk with God is to tell somebody about it. I'm gonna send you a, a book, which is a resource to help you begin reading. And it's some disciplines to help you maintain your thankfulness. It's a book called Following Jesus and you need it in your walk with God. It has disciplines in it. It has, it has exercises in it that if you do them daily, you will grow more into the man or woman of God that he has for you. So send us the text, Jesus to 646 713 Two, three, nine, three. Hey, this week and every day, this week and every day after, let's live like every day is Thanksgiving. Let's live our lives with gratitude, with thanksgiving. Let it overflow. Let it be evident to all. Let us be so thankful for all that God has done in our life that we can rejoice no matter what comes our way. Let's live a life that's so grateful and so thankful that our gentleness and that our faith is obvious to everybody around us. Let's live our life with so much thankfulness and gratitude that we are never anxious about anything. Instead, we know that our God is in control today. Come on, friends, let's live that out. Can I pray over you as you leave? God, I pray over each and every person that you would bless them, that you'd protect them, that you'd bring them back safely on Wednesday for noon prayer. God, I pray that you'd bless each and every person, God, that you would fill them with your joy, that you'd fill them with gratitude, that you would protect them and bless them. Bring them back safely next week. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen and amen and amen. I love you like crazy, church. Can't wait to see you next week. Oh, on Wednesday. It's gonna be great. See you later.